lot of different subjects when we have these capstone projects. So take it away. Well, good morning, afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to start out by thanking my three advisors who are here, Mr. Stephen McAlpine with INDS, Dr. Orbelfinger with English, and Dr. Field with MLL. Thank Those you. are my parents who are right there who fielded more than one phone call complaining about how I had wasted their money because this paper is never going to get written and I'm just never going to graduate. <laughs> and also a few of my friends who have skipped class to be here. <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk now, about... Wait a minute. If you have skipping class to be here, please go back to <laughs> <laughs> That doesn't count your time. Yeah. Uh, so to, um, how many of you have ever sat in a history class and thought, who aren't historians, have sat in a history class and thought, this happened hundreds of years ago. All these people are dead. Why does this matter? Can I get chicken for dinner? Anybody? Show me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, historical narration is one attempt by historians to answer those sorts of questions, minus the chicken for dinner question, I can't really answer that one. Um, it's an attempt to bring the past to the present in a lively and engaging way. And so that's what I went into with my, with my capstone project, and specifically um, how to bring medieval history alive to a modern audience, which is often hard, especially for non-academic American audiences who really don't have any sort of connection to uh, medieval history that happened continent away. And I also uh, concentrated on the handsome Hansards, which was a, they were a gentry family that lived in the late 14th century um, in the north of England. So historical narration, as I said, is basically conveying history as a story. Um, it's historians <coughs> taking any of the historical facts that they find and trying to weave them together to bring connect, to put connections between events and to make it into sort of a flowing narrative. And it's typically, um, it's typically aimed at a non-academic audience, um, somebody who is bringing absolutely no background information to the topic. It combines the disciplines of history and English literature. And my historical narration concentra concentrated on the handsome Hansard, I love that name, um, specifically Robert Hansard, who was a knight of York who died in 1391, and his daughter Margaret. So my main methodology was taken from history, which allowed me to collect and organize sources, basically to figure out the, the who, what, when, where, and how of the Hansards to, to put the pieces of the story together. And then I used English literature to help me write the story, to create a flowing plot and dynamic and developed characters that would keep the audience interested. My main primary sources were the will of Robert, was the will of Robert Hansard, he, as I said, died in 1391, and that was actually the picture that you saw on the first slide. Um, I found his will in an archive at the University of York and spent quite a long while translating and transcribing it, and it's really the key piece of information that we have to how the Hansards lived in the late 14th century. I also relied a lot on the calendar rules, which is basically, they're basically lists of all of the commands that kings sent out to all of their people um, year by year. <coughs> So for example, in 1301, we have a reference to a, another Robert Hansard um, getting called up by King Edward I to gather up some men and go fight the Scots. And so by reading through the calendar rolls, you can kind of trace where a family was and when, what they were doing, and if they were involved with the higher aristocracy and with royalty. And I also drew a lot from the Paston letters. Uh, the Pastons were an up and coming gentry family that lived in the south of England not too long after Margaret and her father, Robert. And they left dozens of letters behind, and it's really a, a very unique uh, opportunity for us to see into how these people thought, how they lived, how they talked to each other. It's, it's really an excellent resource. And two of my, I had many, many secondary sources, but two of the, the best were PJP Goldberg's uh, A Social History of England from 1250 to 1550 as well as William Cronin's article, A Place for Stories, which was a really excellent um, practical look at the pros and cons of historical narration by a historian who uses it all the time. So my main integration techniques were the compound concept of historical narration. Uh, this is taking uh, history's methodology of coming up with sources, figuring out the who, what, when, and combining it with English literature's uh, narrative techniques. And I also created common ground between the disciplines of history 
and literature. Both history and literature seek to um, relate to their audience. They want to get their audience excited. They want to get their audience involved. And so I pulled those together and combined them with the desire of history to convey history in an accurate manner and the desire of English literature to convey a good story. And then I also bridged the explanation action gap. Not only did I analyze uh, historical narration and its pros and cons, I then went and wrote a historical narration of Margaret Hansard. Margaret Hansard proved to be a pretty good subject for this historical narration. She is a member of the gentry, which means that her family has titles and they have some land, but unlike the aristocracy, they don't have land all over the country and they tend to be very rooted in their community. They, they talk to their community leaders a lot, they eat with their, with their reeves, their, um, the overseers of their manors, they work with local artisans, and so they tend to be very good touchstones of the, what was going on in the community and what did people in the community believe and how were they living, as well as how society was changing. And it's also easy for an audience to relate to Margaret Hansard. <coughs> Let's see. She's, um, she's a young woman starting out in her life, and most of us here are either young people starting out in our lives or we remember what it was like to be starting out in our lives. So she had a lot of the similar, she had many similar desires and fears that young people today have. She didn't want to live with her parents or with her older brother for the rest of her life. She wanted to go out and establish her own home and her own family. She maybe wanted to live a little bit better than her parents had. She wanted her children to go out well. Uh, she was concerned about wars that were happening between England and France, just as today we're concerned about wars that are happening in the Middle East. She really is, when you get down to it, she's very similar to, to modern people. And I found that this was an excellent, excellent way to kind of take everything that was happening in the late 14th century England and bring it to an audience through Margaret's life. So in conclusion, as you can probably tell, I'm a big fan of historical narration. I found that it was an extremely effective way of bringing history to the present and keeping modern audiences engaged. And I found that when I talked about just sort of general medieval history to people who were not experts, their eyes would kind of glaze over. But even when I was describing in brief what Margaret Hansard's life was like, they tended to get very interested and start asking more and more questions. And so it's something that I would, that I think I'll definitely continue to do uh, throughout my professional life. And uh, when I go back to England in the fall, I'm looking forward to getting to know the Hansards even better. and I think it's a, a really good way for a lot of people to get into history. I mean, the sheer amount of people who have started talking to me about medieval history, when I start, when I mention that I'm a medieval historian, um, usually I get, wait, what, that's something you can study. But I also get a lot of, oh, I watch the Tudors, and I watch you know, all these other shows. And I found that as long as you keep, um, historical narration and historical fiction are kind of two different things. Whereas historical fiction sort of will change facts to make the story better, historical, an academic, an effective academic historical narration wouldn't do that. You have to fit the story to change the facts. And so it's really, I still have a lot of fun reading histor good historical fiction. And by good, I mean something that's a fun read. Um, and I definitely think that it just, I think that historical fiction, when done well, can hopefully entice people to, to read about the actual history. So I still like reading it. Yeah. <laughs> yes? What was the real challenge in writing your historical narration? The biggest challenge? Um, probably the fact that I was on this continent and not in Britain. Um, a lot of these, a lot of the records uh, that have to do with the Hansards and with uh, the gentry people in general are kept in archives. Um, a lot of them have become digitized thanks to Google Books, but unfortunately a lot of what has been digitized are 19th century Victorians writing up the records and they weren't always accurate with that. Um, I even found, I found a, a write-up of the will of Robert Hansard in an old book and I was able to compare it to my translation and find that it wasn't as accurate. Um, so I'm really looking forward to getting back there and being able to figure out these, these records and not have to rely on books written in 1823 that's like absolutely no, no sources whatsoever. <laughs>
Is there anything meaningful about the handsome Hansers, or is that just alliteration? That's you know, I, I kept finding references to, oh, the handsome Hansards own this castle, and the handsome Hansards were here, and I, as far as I can tell, it's just a nickname they had. Um, what I'm, one of the things that I've been trying to figure out is if that came from any particular story, or if that was just a moniker they got over the years. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. It might have just been the, the alliteration. I mean, yeah, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Last question? Yes. Mom? <laughs> No. Okay. I just wanted to know when you translated the will, what the process was like, and the Latin it was written in. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. was that different than the Latin that you learned? In um, school or? Grammatically, uh, it was fairly similar to, to classical Latin. Once you know classical Latin, medieval Latin is actually a lot simpler because it tends to mirror um, the sentence structures of whatever is the native tongue of the person who's writing it. So if you're translating late medieval English Latin, it's going to keep a lot of the same sort of structure as English. What was really, really frustrating was the fact that it was written by a scribe. What would happen is that when somebody was leaving a will, they'd dictate it to a scribe who would copy it down and then go copy it later into the probate register, which is the big register of wills. And scribes had their own sort of, it's almost like a secret language. They, because they had to write so often and so fast, they had a lot of contractions and abbreviations, and they varied kind of from scribe to scribe, and they had different, um, like certain dashes over words that could mean, oh, this actually goes into ERE or ARE, or I just took out a few syllables. So that was the frustrating part, was actually having to, you know, I ended up writing it out over and over and over again, and each time, it was almost like a puzzle, you just had to keep trying to figure, okay, what is he saying? What is he saying? Is he talking about a church? Is he talking about a horse? I don't know. But you know, eventually I figured it out, and I think it's going to be a lot easier the next time I go at uh, take a go at a, at a document like that. But it's just it was a lot of trial and error, a lot of doing it over and over and over again. Well, thank so. you very much. We have uh, some uh, few words from Carrie, I think, or Stephen. I'm sorry, for you. Well, uh, we're very proud of Allison uh, for earning departmental. Honor. I knight the Sarah And you also have some good news about graduate school. Where will you be doing your graduate school? Um, I got accepted into uh, the program for medieval studies at the University of York. They have a center for medieval studies that's one of the top in the world, so I'm really excited to be going back. <laughs> You're excited to, okay, she's going back to York. Well, so. not only that, she is graduating summa cum laude, which is, uh, I think, almost straight A's, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, she has also received the Mary Jo Clare Award in Interdisciplinary Studies. And this is an award that is given to the student who has uh, performed outstanding duties uh, toward the culture of interdisciplinary studies. And she's been president of our Council of Majors and been very dynamic and active. And we've really enjoyed all that you've done for us. Yeah. So thank you, Allison. <laughs>